right, chapter 20 is the Islamic world powers from 1400 to 1800. And uh, if you have begun reading this particular portion, I'll warn you, I really am fascinated with the Muslim world and their culture and how it developed, uh, the following of this prophet and how it has evolved into uh, the culture that we as Americans particularly view it to be today. Uh, I'm sure you all recognize that what we see in the news uh, is certainly not a complete picture just as the rest of the world sees America through Hollywood's eyes and they have no concept of what uh, a Midwestern uh, college professor doing in a little teeny tiny town in the middle of Nebraska is like. Uh, they have no concept and in many ways, we don't really understand the Muslim world for the same port, uh, from the same point, which is why I like uh, historically looking at it. Uh, it's it's fascinating to me to see how much has changed. If you start in your book in chapter 20, uh, you'll see right away there's several terms you'll want to know. Do keep in mind you're supposed to be looking at those darker, bolded terms. Uh, it kind of help keep you on track for uh, preparation for your tests. The first one is the Ottoman uh, Empire, and the Ottomans are the ruling house of the Turkish Empire, and they ruled from about 1299 to 1922. This is a very long, successful reign of a certain particular people. Uh, Anatolia is another term that you uh, notice in there. Anatolia is uh, a geographical name uh, for that peninsula that juts out into the water. Uh, much of the Balkans and uh, is involved in this. Uh, Turkey is probably the best. If, if you can picture Turkey, that's Anatolia. Uh, just to give you an idea of what that looks like. Again, that's, there's a map in your book if, that, if you're struggling with that. You'd also want to know Sultan. And Sultan is an Arabic word that ultimately means authority or dominion. Uh, but the Muslims use it to uh, delineate someone that's in power. In particular, your book talks about Constantinople falling to Sultan Mehmet II. And with that, we see uh, the rise of this particular empire. Uh, next up, your book talks about Suleiman, uh, who grew the Ottoman territory to the largest extent. And, and beyond that point, many times they're just trying to hold their territory and protect it uh, instead of grow it. Uh, the Ottomans are known for perfecting their political system during this time as well. You have the Sultan that's obviously at the very top. He's the ruler. Uh, underneath him, you have that power basically draining down and such as a funnel. You have um, governors, police officers, military generals, treasurers, uh, viziers. Uh, these are the chief assistants to the caliphs. And um, we see a long legacy after Suleiman I uh, of legal precedents and codes that really do drive the Ottoman Empire for generation upon gen generation. Uh, the Ottoman Empire did use slaves, and uh, they often would take Christian boys that they had conquered and put them into slavery, and they started a process that they called Debshirne, and this was uh, this idea that these young men were now going to be converted to Islam. They are going to... Uh, service slaves to the Muslim world. Uh, there are even some that are trained for military service, and these are called Janissaries. Uh, in the Ottoman Empire, the Muslim world, they also used concubines, uh, which I think we probably have a little bit of a misunderstanding of what concubine actually means. They are recognized as a spouse, uh, culturally and religiously speaking, um, but uh, she was... Uh, not as high up in the food chain, so to speak. Uh, they didn't have any rights or power, uh, which is not completely unheard of as far as a female goes anyway. Um, but if she actually did give birth to a male, she could raise the child until he reached age 10 or 11. Um, and then he was given providence to rule under the guidance of his mother if he's the only boy. So um, there are certain rights and benefits to being a concubine or the child of a concubine. Uh, the next term you'd want to know, you'll see show up on page 593, and that's the Safed Dynasty, or the Safed Empire. Um, these are uh, a portion of that 
uh, world where we see Turkish Sufis, also known as Kizilbash, uh, and they are uh, basically those that are working for the Shah. So you want to know uh, Safed, you want to know uh, Kizilbash, and you want to know Shah as far as terms for your test. You also see during this time period the rise of uh, another religious authority, uh, and uh, you see with that change in religious authority, you see a struggle begin uh, within the Muslim community. Uh, who is truly the, the leader or the ruler of the Muslim world? Who is the uh, voice of authority of the, of the Muslim world? And when we see um, the ulama, U-L-A-M-A, -A, um, these were religious men who translated the Quran and the Sunnah, uh, which the Sunnah is uh, kind of a, an extra that is not actually religious text, but it's uh, a gathering of Muhammad's lessons, his stories, etc. So it's... it's uh, it's like a Devo book in the Christian world, except for it's held in very high regard. The Quran is the tip top as far as the most important, but right underneath that would be uh, the Sunnah. Um, anyway, just make sure that you are a little bit familiar with what the Muslim world is starting to evolve into at this point. Um, another name that uh, pops up here is Babur. Um, he was uh, claiming to be an ancient ancestor of Shanghai Khan and Timur, who are very important to this area of the world as far as great conquerors, great leaders, great warriors. Um, Next up is Akbar. He was a grandson of Babur. Um, he expanded the Mughal Empire, which you want to know Mughal Empire for sure. Uh, pushes that deeper into India. Uh, grows this particular portion of the world further and further. Um, and they begin to find struggles with the Muslims during this time period. The Muslim world is so much more than just growing uh, geographically as well as religiously. The changes that are coming with who is leading what and how does that look and how does that work. They're also growing artistically. And your book talks a little bit about what that looks like. They're, they're weaving rugs, these elaborate, beautiful pieces of art uh, that are woolen carpets. They're woven by women and children. Think of the small hands and what they could do. Uh, they're producing miniature paintings that are being put into books and they're illustrating those books. Uh, these books are highly regarded as well as others. They're collecting books and putting them into what we would now call a library. Uh, Akbar had one of 24,000 volumes. We also see uh, art coming into play as far as their uh, architecture. They take great pride in what they're building and what it looks like. And so we see things such as the Taj Mahal, which if you've not seen that, please do look in your book. It's got a gorgeous picture of it. It was built as a memorial to Shah Jahan's wife. A uh, superb mix of Muslim and Indian architecture. Um, took 21 years to build. And he didn't just have this one wife. He had many wives, but she was his favorite. Uh, as a matter of fact, she was number three in the lineup. Uh, but central is, of course, the tomb, but the marble dome is what most people even focus on today. The gates inscriptions, quite beautiful. O soul, thou art at rest. Return to the Lord at peace with him, and he at peace with you. Uh, beyond this artistic um, physical realm, you also have flowers. Uh, they're, they're growing these gorgeous gardens, uh, which was a Persian tradition that just really did continue on even into this age, but it becomes an important part of who they are. Uh, it's truly a symbol of true beauty uh, and a symbol of paradise for them as well. And we also see uh, it influencing Muslim literature, what they're writing. Uh, they're writing more than just religious uh, pieces of work. They're also writing poetry, uh, and they're using a lot of these gardens and these pieces of art to remind them of what beauty is and influence them in that way. Uh, we also are seeing... Scientifically, they're growing as well. There's an interest in uh, learning more about medicine and what they can do. They're creating uh, uh, 
Ottoman Medical School. Uh, they're learning um, how to be better physicians and they were having to go to medical school if they're going to practice within the empire. Uh, you also have uh, problems though that continue with discrimination amongst uh, those that are Muslim and are not and then even more specifically within the Muslim community uh, because there are some that are not as Muslim as others. Uh, we see the six come in here. Uh, they said that uh, they were a part of the original Muslims as well, but they are, uh, they kind of take some of the ideas of Muslim world and Hindu world and combine those. Culturally speaking, uh, we see coffee play a major role. And, and some of you are big coffee drinkers and you get this. It's not just about the actual drink. It's about the socialization that goes with it. Uh, people are sitting in coffee houses and talking and sharing ideas. Uh, this is very European and it's happening in the Muslim world. Uh, it was a, a, a coffee house was a meeting place for them to uh, converse and share ideas. Uh, most of the time these are men and uh, they're, they're speaking in ways that are also going to be socially advantageous to them as well uh, as politically. Um, there becomes a little bit of a problem though. Muslim clerics become wary of caffeine and the effects of coffee and they begin to forbid the use of coffee as well as alcohol because uh, they see that they are both intoxicants. Uh, and so we see that uh, the Muslim world begins to shine coffee houses as a house of immoral behavior. Who knew? Uh, we also see uh, this chapter talks a lot about non-Muslims under Muslim rule and how does that impact them. It's not just Muslim, or excuse me, Islam as a religion in this, this particular area. You also have Hindus, which I've already elaborated, or, or mentioned, excuse me. Uh, you have the Jains, the Zoroastrians, you have Christians, uh, and the Sikhs. All of these are under Muslim rule in this larger empire. Uh, Akbar was known to be very... Um, concerned about all of his people, Muslim and not, uh, and he was known to celebrate Hindu festivals and traditions. He even had wives that were not Muslim, uh, but those that refused to convert to Islam, uh, they were charged a jizza, and uh, this jizza is a tax. Uh, it was not exorbitant, but it was something to acknowledge I'm not Muslim, uh, but I'm living in your world, and I'm going to live peacefully. And we so we see this happening uh, quite a bit. Uh, we also see a shift in trade patterns. You see the Europeans try to come in to the Muslim world and trade with some of them. Uh, they're fascinated with some of their artwork, the rugs particularly. Uh, we see a lot of that happening, and they're trading at places called factory forts. Um, they would in these factory forts have residences, offices, warehouses. All of these were under the British East India Company, which you've at least heard of before. Uh, some of these woven claws, I, I've mentioned rugs, but they also were weaving amazing cloths that the Europeans wanted for dresses, uh, etc. Clothing that the Europeans were wanting to use. And so trade was booming, uh, particularly the Europeans just loved what the Muslims were carrying. Uh, with this opening of trade, the Europeans, particularly the British, see an opportunity and they want to take over India. Um, and they do this uh, kind of covertly through the British East India Company. The British are concerned about an attack by the Muslims and so they employ uh, locals to turn into basically an army for them and they're called sepoys, which you'd want to know that for your test. Uh, the, the issue of the British being in India is larger than just uh, the impact they have on the locals. It's They bring some of their other rivalries with them. Uh, the French are always uh, struggling with, well, you've got more than we do. I, I always allude to the idea of keeping up with the Joneses. And the French are frustrated that the British have this. And so we see uh, fighting over land that ultimately brings us to one of the treaties of Paris which happened in 1763 and this is what begins what we now uh, in modern modernity call the British 
in our British in, Empire in India. My apologies for stumbling all over my words. We do begin to see a political decline. Uh, the Safed dynasty, uh, they're struggling financially. They can't pay their military, which means they can't protect their territories, and they begin to be susceptible to foreign invasions. The Ottoman Empire, they've got poor leadership. Um, the leaders that are uh, involved, they've got portions of the land, and the brothers that are uh, ruling these portions of the land begin to fight within themselves, making them very vulnerable. Again, the military is not what it needs to be. Um, and the same thing essentially happens within the Mughal Empire as they've been split up into territories, uh, and so there's not a true central authority anymore. Uh, that's about all I'll say about this particular chapter. Make sure you read and catch all those words. Let me know if you've got some questions.